Hi. Welcome back. Um, my name's Hugh Newman. Some of you know me, most of you probably. Some of you don't. I organize the conference, uh, I travel the world, I explore. And uh, one of the things I've been getting really into over the last six to eight months is looking at megalithic quarries. Now, you might think that's a little bit strange, but actually, it's a very important part of the whole megalithic culture from different parts of the world. And I believe that it's actually an ancient tradition where the birthplace of the temple is the quarry. So we're gonna look at some examples in this lecture um, and about how I believe these stones were chosen because of their special powers, because of their location. So there's geodesy involved in the quarry location and also where the site was then placed and built according to where the quarry was. Freemasons, uh, Templars, and even traditions today still revere the quarry as the sacred place, as the birthplace of the temple. And rituals, even today, are still carried out there. But first, I just want to um, show some respect to the great John Michel. Many of you knew him. He was there at the very start of megalithomania. In fact, he allowed us to use the name megalithomania from his 1982 book. Uh, which is an absolute classic. And this just small quote here, I'll let you read it yourself, just gives an inkling of what we're dealing with even today, even though this was written in 1969 from his great book, The View Over Atlantis. And he was aware of the birthplace of the temple. He was aware of the quarries, and he mentions that in some of his writings. So today we're just gonna look at a few examples uh, in the next 50 or 55 minutes uh, obviously Stonehenge, the Bluestone Quarry in Priscelli, is a fascinating place in itself. But, as Robin Heath has pointed out quite clearly, it's related to the placement of Stonehenge. So we're going to have a quick look at that. We're also going to look at Aswan Quarry in Egypt, uh, Baalbek as well, and Solomon's Quarries, which are very interesting. But we're then going to have a good look at the Gebekli Tepe and its sister site, Karahan Tepe, which is a very unknown site but they revere and still have this ancient tradition, I believe. Then we have the lazy stones of Oyente Tambo in Peru and the quarry up on the opposite mountain. And also on Easter Island and uh, a couple of examples from the Olmec world in Mexico. And then I'm gonna just have a brief outline of, why th of how important it is and how ritualized it has become. And now it's not only revered by the Freemasons and previously the Templars, but also by native societies today. So Stonehenge is the first example. Uh, roughly 140 miles west of Stonehenge, we do have uh, the Priscelli Bluestone site. Here's just some, uh, some nice uh, shots of Stonehenge taken on one of our tours a couple of years ago. And it was around, even though it was built, they think now about 3250 BC, the Bluestones were placed there at 2950 BC, according to various people. There is evidence, though, of earlier bluestone activity with some of the shards found under the stones at Stonehenge. Um, so this really fascinates me, suggesting that they were showing that the very earliest, the start, the start phase, the beginning phase of Stonehenge was actually to do with Priscelli. The legend states that Merlin brought the stones from Ireland uh, which was written uh, back in the 12 or 1300s. Uh, and this is the oldest known depiction, illustration of Stonehenge, showing Merlin with a giant. So I believe this is Merlin. A lot of people thought this was him, but I think this is Merlin instructing the giants to build Stonehenge. And they were said to have brought the stones over from Ireland, but potentially it's actually the Bluestone site in Wales. The famous Lunation Triangle, discovered by Robin Heath, his brother's here today, obviously. Um, if, it, if it's expanded 2,500 times over the landscape, we get this, linking the Bluestone site with Lundy Island with Stonehenge. So does it suggest Stonehenge was placed according to where they quarried the stone from originally, the Bluestone site? I suggest that might well be the case. Recent research has been done there by various archaeologists who say the sacred springs there. It's actually still a sacred site. And this energy was then 
put into Stonehenge. So there's a lot of very interesting sort of theories and examples flying around about that. This just shows you uh, the actual blue, one of the bluestone sites itself. And you can see this beautiful rock. It's almost, they're almost cut and ready to go by the looks of it. But this is actually how they form naturally. And there are examples of stoneworking actually still at the quarry, as though it's like a signature of these ancient people leaving marks there so future generations can work out where the stones actually came from. This is a couple of examples of um, some of the uh, Pythagorean triangles linking sites across the landscape, most notably here, obviously, with Stonehenge. And even um, Peter Knight came up with uh, this brilliant Wessex Astrum linking Stonehenge with a place called Broccoli and Avebury and Glastonbury and other sites. But the line here actually goes to the blue stone site as well. It is actually this line here, just extending. And it even goes all the way around the world, which is something I get into more in my Earth Grids book. So it does show you the importance of the quarry site, the birthplace of the temple at Stonehenge, which is um, quite a good example. As one quarry, now this is an absolutely fascinating place. A lot of the stone throughout Egypt was actually quarried from here. There's several different quarries in the Aswan area. This unfinished obelisk weighs 1,168 tonnes, uh, which is one of the largest work stones on the planet. Uh, it's unfinished, it's still, still in situ, it's still partly attached to the bedrock. Uh, the biggest obelisk ever erected in Egypt was around 500 tonnes. This is over twice that weight. Uh, and you can see, you know, when you go to Egypt, you look at some of these obelisks all over the, the country. It is utterly incredible and absolutely blew my mind when I first went there and actually witnessed some of these obelisks. But this one really fascinates me because it is an example of the biggest stone left in the quarry. I, I always think there's, a, from my research, as you'll see today, it's as though they left the largest one in the quarry as well as it being the sacred birthplace of the temple. So I've got a very short video here I'm going to play about uh, the quarry and about other sites that, got, that were built from that particular stone. The unfinished obelisk in Aswan weighs 1,168 tonnes, which is a remarkable feat in itself. What's also amazing is the fact that Many of the stones, the casing stones of two of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau actually came from Aswan. Uh, we travelled all the way up the Nile, several hundred miles, uh, and they cased two of the pyramids, not the Great Pyramid, the other two pyramids, um, with these particular stones. They're polygonal style, and uh, they're just an incredible sight to behold. So we can see that there's red and black granite on this pyramid, not just red granite as I originally thought. So it's like a combination. I believe this was part of the original construction and not a later addition. It seems to like it must have gone quite far up and it's just toppled down some cataclysmic event. There are many other sites all over Egypt that do come from Aswan Quarry. You can just see, like, see this huge block here, and you can just see the length of this. It's been precision carved. Whether it was done with these diorite balls, we're really not sure about, but um, there's a lot more uh, granite across Egypt than just this. It looks like this quarry that they've just scooped out the rock really perfectly, just almost like it's ice cream or butter and they've just removed it as though it's an extremely easy process for them. And they've left a mark here with some hieroglyphics on, which are fascinating. I wonder what that says and who could have done this. These are the dolerite balls that are said to have uh, chipped away and kind of created um, all these obelisks and other things here at Aswan Quarry, but it doesn't really make sense. I mean, maybe they, as Marcus Allen points out, uh, they were used for rolling the stones on. No way, that's uh, just dolerite blocks doing that. That's some kind of machinery, it looks like. It's like machinery, doesn't it? 
Anyway, Aswan Quarry is an amazing place. Um, there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye because of so much stone that's been taken to all these various other places, often hundreds of miles away. There are geodetic connections between this this site and uh, the Giza pyramids um, because there's a 365.4 mile length between them, which uh, basically marks out the, the days of the year so it's just a tip of the iceberg you can check out a full analysis uh, an article I did on this on ancient-origins.net so you can see um, this is a quick video I made about that I just thought I'd show you that so it gives you some sort of first-hand shots of it uh, this this is just the uh, casing stone on the smaller pyramid, the smallest pyramid at uh, the Giza Plateau, and you can just see the size of these. These are beautifully cut, these are transported 600 miles from Aswan Quarry, and these are exactly the same style you find in Peru and Bolivia, but also in Turkey and various other places around the world. Um, and in fact, the earliest known directors of the Aswan Quarry was employed by Ramesses III, named Huri about 1170 BC, although there's evidence, obviously, because of the construction of the pyramids, that it was used much, much earlier. But this is the earliest known date that the Aswan Quarry was in use. It was in use for at least a 1,000 years, although technically probably two or 3,000. Uh, and even inside the Great Pyramid, we have the 70-ton granite lintels above the king's chamber. These are also from Aswan Quarry. So it becomes quite a task when you actually think about it, some of the tonnage involved here. And it really does suggest there was a very high technology or very sophisticated technique, at least, of how they would move it.